thank you very much for uh, coming here today. So what I'm going to uh, discuss with you is the, a project which started many, many, many years ago, but uh, it uh, was it struggled to uh, attract uh, funding. So this is why the process was slow-ish. And uh, I think, but I think I feel now we are in a good uh, place and we have a good knowledge and good understanding and about uh, this uh, capacitive uh, thermoelectric converters. Uh, my name is Peter Petrov. I don't think I need to introduce myself. Uh, I have the privilege together with my colleagues to run the uh, Royce facility in White City on uh, level eight in your building and uh, maybe so uh, this uh, facility has more than 600 square meters of lab space 140 square meter of which are in a clean room area and this is a place for fast prototyping this is the place where you come with your idea and you don't Need, need to leave the floor until you implement your idea into a device with uh, major characteristics. So, you know, we have uh, various type of deposition systems there. Uh, we have pulse laser deposition, sputtering, even evaporation, a lot of facilities for uh, uh, micro and nano structuring. We have and milling machines, we have uh, e beam. We have photolithography, we have industrial inductively coupled plasma array, a lot of uh, facilities for characterization, X ray diffraction, SCM, Raman, for surface analysis, we have profilometry and FM, and uh, a lot of equipment for electrical testing. But let's return to the initial topic. So here is the outline of my presentation today. After a very short introduction about the challenge and our solution, I'll take you through the materials uh, development journey, which we uh, had. And maybe in 30, 35 minutes, I'll conclude this talk with short conclusion, conclusions and forward-looking ideas and uh, collaborations uh, initiatives, possible collaboration initiatives. So all, th all this work was inspired by the fact that we are losing about 65%, more than 60% of the heat generated energy. And this is at the time when we are facing this uh, energy crisis. So if we keep on the pace which we develop our technologies and our needs in 15, 20 years time, there'll be no energy enough to power all devices which we use every day. And all this heat waste could be categorized in three main uh, ways. So uh, high, uh, high, uh, high, uh, high uh, temperature waste energy uh, is uh, the energy which is produced by the combustion, proce uh, combustion process medium. This is the exhaust of this combustion pro uh, process. And these two uh, type of energies, they usually very well utilize. The one which we are interested in is this small, uh, small heat uh, energy. And this is the energy which is produced by the device which we use every day by our phones, our uh, 
computers. And this energy is never recovered. Although this is about 60%, more than 60% of all wasted energy. So the question is, how does it possible? Yes, it's possible because our telephones, they, when they in idle mode, they produce about 0 0.2 watts of energy, of heat energy. When we make a call, it goes up to nearly a watt. And imagine if we can recover this energy. We are making call and at the same time, we recharge our battery. And uh, this is a statistic which I uh, found very come across very recently. So everyone knows Internet of Things, but in China, the number of connected in the uh, connected things surpass the number of connected people. So now we have more things connected than people. And all these things, they re require energy. And this energy is not huge. So it's from, it varies from uh, microamps to milliamps. So these are all sorts of sensors. And imagine this heat energy being converted to power these uh, things. And the question is, why don't we do this? And the main reason is because the materials which we use at the moment, they are not efficient enough to make this conversion economically attractive, economically viable. So if we have to uh, convert, if we wish to convert this, uh, energy into electricity, we have to develop a super material, which uh, we, we may develop it in the future. But, but the solutions which we are proposing now is different. Let's, instead of uh, doing this uh, process, instead of using High efficient material, let's do this process of conversion more rapidly. So, to have more acts of uh, energy conversion per unit time, and then we'll gain this, then we'll gain enough energy. And to do this, let's use materials in two film form because it will be very easy to heat and cool them. And let's use earth abundant materials like ferroelectric materials. And, uh, and then you'll say, oh, you're great, that's fantastic. So, but why people haven't, didn't think about this before? No, people did think about this. The first paper which I was able to find about this uh, uh, conversion is from. Uh, 1960, it was published in 1961. So, where they proposed this idea to use perelectric materials as means to convert electric uh, heat into electricity. A year later, there was another paper which made a really thorough mathematical analysis of this process, and they come up with the number. 7% efficiency, 7% uh, Carnot cycle efficiency for this process. And, but at that end, let's say, and uh, what they said, okay, we have to find materials which will be able to heat and cool quickly or to be able to, uh, to, to do this process. And this idea was kind of, forgotten for nearly 50 years until uh, 2011, when our colleagues from St. Petersburg 
uh, published, uh, they uh, re revived this idea and said, look, let's instead of bulk materials, let's use thin films. So then we'll be able to do this process much faster and we'll be able to uh, convert uh, energy more efficiently. Even they proposed this device where we have a movable thermal switch between the place with high temperature and a ferroelectric uh, capacitor. And using commands, they move this uh, uh, switch, heat switch up and down. And they promise about one milliwatt per square millimeter if you work at 680 kilohertz or even 2.3 uh, milliwatts if uh, this device operate at the frequency of 340 kilohertz. So, and so how does this work? So this, as I said, this idea is very, very old. So this, this, this is so-called two capacitor generators. So we have two capacitor, one with variable capacitance and one uh, which is used to charge the system. So we start with two capacitors and then at room temperature, we charge the variable capacitor. Then altering the temperature, increasing the temperature, the dielectric uh, permittivity of this material will fall down, which means that the capacitance will go down, but the charge will be still there, which means that the voltage will be high up. So then when we close this switch, this voltage will push the charges through this external uh, resistor and will have current produced in the system. And then again, well, we can charge the uh, variable capacitor and do this in a cycle. And even, okay, there is a video of this, this uh, tunable capacitor. So radio heads, they will remember <laughs> this uh, uh, device, the heterogen, and there is another capacitor, and, and there is a motor which rotates, changes this capacitor, uh, capacitor, and you see the light diode lighting up. So when the rotation stops, the light stops, and if we are rotating faster, the lights is, uh, so the, the current is high, the, the light is brighter. So, and this is how the uh, power generated, converted by this device uh, could be estimated. So we see that it will, the, so where K, this is the, difference between high capacitance and low capacitance, the tunability of the capacitance, maximum capacit capacitance voltage, which we use for, um, for the operation to charge this variable capacitor, and the frequency of operation. And if we increase the frequency, the power will, the, the generated power will increase proportionally. So, uh, this voltage you shouldn't worry you a lot because the material, the capacitor which we charge is the electric. So there is very minimal leakage current. Means that the voltage, the power which we, we the power which we supply for this device to work is negligible. So we are just playing with voltage. Uh, but do these materials exist? So, for, so the problem with the ferroelectric materials is that so they have a really good thermal instability, 
But as soon as you made them in thin film form, everything collapses. You apply voltage, collapses even further. So the question is, do materials do such a material exist in thin film form? Can we find material which will be which will have a such a high temperature and stability in thin film form and under voltage? And if they exist, what will be the maximum frequency of operation? So how quickly we'll be able to heat and cool them down? And finally, can we find uh, heat flux with such a modulation? So can we modulate the heat which is which we supply to the, to this device? So and these are the three questions which I'll try to uh, cover in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes. Because imagine if the answer to all these three questions will be yes, then there will be a twofold benefit. Firstly, we'll be able to, the, to recover this heat wasted energy and reuse it in batteries or in something else. Or, and if this is a CPU of the computer, we wouldn't need this extra cooling so that this device will cool down the processor. So we will save the energy of this forced heat uh, cooling, which is uh, usually used in all these uh, electronic devices. So we'll have this twofold benefit. And the material systems which we explore were barium titanium uh, circulate and barium calcium. So this material, so why this material? Because it has this uh, triple point at uh, just above the room temperature. And this is the line where the instability, uh, where this uh, transition uh, happens, so which means that the temperature instability of the material will be very high. So what we need, we need a material which will be most unstable at temperatures above room temperature near up to let's say 100 degrees, because this is the temperature which will of operation of the CPUs and of the most of electronic devices. So if we find a material with uh, temperature instability in these temperatures, so this is will be in the game. So uh, and these materials were firstly sintered. So the results which I'll show that materials were sintered by Mohammed. So uh, from in our powder lab, really beautiful uh, targets, single phase. Then with uh, the temperature stability was amazing. So, but this wasn't surprise. So this is this is what we were expecting. So the temperature instability in both form fantastic. So then we use these uh, packs as uh, uh, targets for uh, thin film deposition and made uh, cluster structures using uh, all available equipment and characterized them in the uh, prop stations where we were able to alter the temperature. And so it wasn't surprised that we were able to make a really good epitaxial film. But what was the, okay, it was kind of surprise was this huge temperature instability. So we were just at this uh, transition, phase transition uh, point and the temperature and at around 100, 120 degrees, we have a really, really good uh, uh, temperature, uh, capacitance or epsilon uh, 
to the bill, temperature to the bill. And the uh, other good thing was that the leakage current was really low. So it's in the picoamps uh, range. So it's it's uh, really good. So this is the other material system. Again, uh, five volt, six volt change of the capacitance. And it's okay. Uh, we did uh, for the electrical measurement, and uh, so and uh, trying to optimize these structures, and found out that uh, for different uh, delta T. So if uh, we have uh, temperature change five degrees, ten, twenty degrees, so we can. Uh, at different frequencies, we can get uh, power which is nearly up to milliwatt. So, uh, and uh, also the other degree of flexibility is the um, thickness of the films and volts and the and the uh, voltage which we apply to the structure. And you you see this this forward. So all these parameters they interlinked. So if if you wish to have a very high capacitance, you won't be able to work at very high frequency because the uh, RC constant of the of the uh, fit of the device will be high. If you have very high capacitance. Uh, then it it might be uh, it, uh, it will be if you get high voltage, then the capacitance will drop down, and uh, the K factor will also drop. So all these factors are interlinked. So this is why we were trying to figure out what is the the best uh, the best K. Scenario and here we so this is with extreme 50, uh, delta T of 50 degrees, but you see it's above one milliwatt uh, milliwatt per square millimeter. So this is a lot of energy which could potentially be uh, scavenged by uh, this device. So this is the uh, are the material system where these numbers are even high. And these are the numbers which we calculate based on the measurements which we have done. Another material system which came from uh, our colleagues from Bulgaria, it's just uh, uh, hot from the oven. So this is uh, uh, council carbonate. So this material, was developed in Bulgaria for uh, to be uh, thermoelectric uh, converter, but uh, so they measure really okay, not really high, but uh, high enough uh, ZT. Uh, the ZT uh, coefficient of this material is relatively high, it's one and a half or approaching two. And uh, we set up and they Ask us to analyze it, and we said, "Okay, let's analyze it for our for our purposes." Of course, no surprise, we were able to make a really good. Not we, Mohammed was able to grow a really good epitaxial film out of this material, and uh, and then when we measure it, so the the electric properties of this material were absolutely amazing. So the permittivity in the bulk material was about the room temperature was about 53k. Maximum 8 800k. In tin film form, 25k at room temperature and 225k at the the max. So I've been working with such a materials for a very, very long time, but I haven't seen such a values for the for tin films. 
So, of course, we'll have need to further investigate this, but the preliminary results are absolutely fantastic. And the uh, resistivity of this material in thin film form is also quite useful. In bulk uh, form, of course, so they were thermoelectric materials, so they, they were aiming to get a very low resistivity. But in thin film form, it's fantastic. So, so this is the material which will explore further. Thin film is again in the range of 20 uh, nanometers. Yes, 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 between 100 and 300. So, okay, I think I managed to answer the first two questions. So now the question is, is it possible to achieve heat flux modulation? Uh, with uh, such a frequency. And here comes our uh, colleague from University of Westminster. So this is the uh, floor plan of uh, I7 uh, process. So it has seven, uh, eight cores, and all these cores, they don't work all at the same time, not necessarily. And imagine if you manage to uh, control the workload to this processor and varying the workload, you'll be able to uh, vary the temperature in this on this course. And then our device will, will work quite well. And so this was the questions which we asked ourselves been asking ourselves for a long time until I met Professor Getov at a private party in Bulgaria like this. So when we are when when we are at work, we'll talk about families. When we are parties, talk about work. <laughs> and, and this guy I found out that uh, he already measured this. So he measured how would uh, temperature. Okay, this is not i7. This is on the i5 processor. The temperature of the processor will change if we change the workload on the, uh, the on the processor. Yes, the time scale is is enormous here, but the good news is that here the 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 take off and drop down temperatures are exponential. So potentially we can work there is a range where we could work and get temperature change nearly 20 degrees. So this is how the temperature will change if we alter the uh, load, the workload on the processor and, or how many cores will have engaged in the computing process. So this it's quite quite promising. So, and here my quick conclusion. So I think I've been able to maybe not convince you, but at least intrigue you that these thin film capacitive thermoelectric converters have a really good future, especially if we use these materials, which have such a uh, high temperature instability and such a low uh, leakage current. So the the challenges, the still uh, unsolved challenges, is how to modulate this uh, uh, this uh, heat flux. So we need computers engineers who will make a special uh, so will make a special software which will dynamically control the workload of the processor to uh, alter to alter these uh, temperatures. And something which I forgot to mention was that these temperatures which Professor Getov measured was uh, where the temperatures of the CPU at all. So the temperature in so it means including the packaging. The temperature inside will be different and it will change differently. So 
Again, there is, so all this data which I'm presenting is quite conservative. So there is a lot of room for improvement of all this data. So also we need artificial intelligent machine learning to optimize the parameters because as I said, all these capacitance, tunability, frequency, volt applied, all this uh, data is interlinked. We, so now we are building up and we have a good database with uh, uh, with uh, this data. So now we have to find somehow to, a way to to optimize. Uh, so to say to be able to say if we wish to operate this temperature, we have to use this uh, uh, this uh, stoichiometry with such a thickness, at such a voltage, at such a frequency, and. And last but not the least, is we need input from electrical engineer who will be able to uh, make this, uh, uh, to design and make this uh, switching uh, uh, power, power distribution part of the device where we'll uh, alter the charge discharge uh, parameters. So this point, I like to thank our collaborators from Bulgaria, from the Institute of General Inorganic Chemistry, Bulgarian Clinical Science, Professor Getov from University of France, Westminster, and all people from my group who contributed to, uh, to this project. So most recently, Mohamed, Ken Yang, and uh, Chuck. So, uh, Tanyang and Chuck were the last master students working on this project. The project, so the idea started, so the project started maybe in 2014-13, so where Andre, Zenk, and Emily were making the first bulk material, and everybody else who were involved in this uh, project. And I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, for your attention. And should we have any questions, I'm happy to take. Yes, please. In terms of material research and application, I, I often find that you maybe take inspiration from biological systems, especially the brain, thin membrane structures, that sort of thing, because I... I, I, I used to work for Carbonate uh, with yeah. Professor Colin Hills and Paula Carey. And um, I always thought maybe the link between maybe biological thin membrane structures and maybe electrical material science could be there. Yeah, so this is not an idea which uh, we uh, we can uh, throw away, but I don't think I have enough knowledge to be able to answer this uh, more precisely. Yeah, so we don't the main reason for uh, thin films in this, in our case, is the ability to be able to alter this temp temperature the, more quickly because the uh, temperature, the heat load of this structure is, is low, so you can quickly do the changes. Yes, but but the brain, for example, regulates heat and uh, you think maybe. So we need to. So yes, we. So actually, it, it will be other way around. So right. if if we manage to re regulate the heat at high rate, then we will be able to. We are talking about waste energy here, right? Yes. Now, do you have an idea how much energy the brain consumes? I, I imagine it's quite, it's a quite high, or not, not no. very much. No, no the no. brain consumes as a small light bulb, 20, right. 30, 40 watts. Right. So there is no need of thermal management. There is no need to cooling or whatever. We don't feel that this is hotter than here. So that's it. Okay, okay. So if we can manage to get to the 
energy consumption of the brain in our future developments, that, that's excellent. But at the moment, the brain is okay about energy. <laughs> yes, of course, yes. Yeah. Right. Well, I have a question, and I think you know what it's going to be. The, uh, the, would this will all depend on the uh, ability to thermally cycle the thin film, which is why you're using a thin film, in order to heat and discharge that heat. And that will all depend on the thermal properties, the thermal diffusivity, the thermal conductivity of the film itself. So is it possible to model the, the, whether you can manage to get this frequency? Because what really what you want is this frequency of operation to be as high as possible. I can see that you could, over a period of seconds, you could heat up and cool down a thin film, but can you do it in a period over microseconds and so forth? So the answer is yes, we did a modeling of this. So it was quite a rough modeling or like estimation. And the modeling said that yes, so the, the temperature of the of the film will change with the speed with at almost at the same rate as the 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 temperature of the heat source. So if we manage to alter the temperature of the heat source. Of the heat source, I see. Then then it's it's fine. So the question is, can we uh, alter the temperature of the yeah. processor that, that quickly? So with this yeah. uh, work altering the workload. Mm -hmm. Most probably the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the question is how quickly we can do this and then and then this will fit in into our design mm. say okay we have to work at this frequency so which means that the maximum capacitance will be whatever mm. the maximum so the epsilon should be i just wonder whether there are any whether a folk in either electrical engineering or even civil engineering really who would have that thermal modeling ability to really nail down because it might be good to do a back of the envelope which is what you've done but, but so because, because it's uh, so so the thickness of this uh, of this layer is uh, hundreds of nanometers yeah. so, so 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 we were modeling this using and as a model material we were using pzt and uh and, 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 and uh which are very well. And I don't think there'll be much difference yeah, in the thermal yeah. properties between those. Especially this, uh, at this, uh, yeah. at this uh, thicknesses. And so the, the result which uh, we got was very, very high frequency. Yeah. So, so ridiculously high. Yeah. So, which made me think, oh, do we, do we model this correctly? Mm -hmm. But, um, so, yeah. what is the value in capturing the heat loss versus the cost of device? Uh, okay, so the capturing, so, uh, so the, the, the straight answer is, I don't know. Because so so we have to make the uh, we have to estimate the cost of this device when it's when it's done and when it's integrated into the into the let's say in the CPU. But I don't think the cost will be substantial. And so at the so when we have more information about what we can do then I think we'll be able to answer this question more precisely yeah. at the moment. I think, I think with global temperatures exceeding 1.5 to whatever, I think the cost is something that we're going to have to ignore for a while. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Any other questions? All right.
I've got to say, this new material, the cobalt, got cobalt eight is is cobalt. It's, it's so I have never ever seen it. Quite extraordinary. Does this material have any other current applications? Or? So it's developed for thermoelectric converter, but not in not capacitive thermoelectric converter. It's just thermoelectric material. Yeah. And what's the, is that? Is what's the ZT of that material? Is that the one point five? Yes, 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 yes. Very good. Yes, it's it's really good. Extraordinary. Yes. And we are trying to even estimate the ZT of the film, and I think we 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 have heard the result of I I didn't put it here. Be less good. <laughs> <laughs> Just being like devil's advocate, let's say you put it into a, a mobile phone, right? And you have the thin films and you can make the CPU cycle quite quickly and you're getting this peak the high frequency temperature change. The phone's made of a lot of other stuff. And you're gonna necessarily it's got all that's gonna heat up as well as even if you're cycling quickly. Have you thought about how you get around something like that? Or will it, or will it pose a problem? Oh, the phone works at a temperature, so it cannot work at very high or very low temperature. And what when we what when you change the load on the CPU, so you alter this yeah. working temperature. Mm -hmm. And so and uh, as I said, there are two fold benefits. Firstly, you alter this uh, temperature, and you recharge the the battery at the same. Yeah. Time. And secondly, you because you're taking the energy out of the CPU, mm -hmm. this wasted energy, you don't really need to cool it down. I guess my question is more like, because it depends on the temperature change, right? Yes. But even though you're cycling quite quickly, the rest of the phone will probably heat up as well, which will mean you'll experience a less of a temperature change because the rest of the, the rest of the material will end up getting hot too. So, so this is so this is uh, the the research which has to be done in the future. So how and where you integrate with. So because if you <coughs> include this layer at the where the silicon is mm -hmm. before encapsulating, then encapsulation will shield you from to some extent, and then you'll be able to alter this more quickly. So the the kid, oh, no, no. So the, the specialists. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not about specialism here. Um, so, so, so it's a very interesting question. Um, so basically, there is a potential for um, uh, uh, for a, 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 a next step, like challenge for for the the engineers building um, digital electronics, because the way they build digital electronics is make it as as suitable as possible for cooling. Mm -hmm. Now, what we say here, wait a minute, if you guys can make it uh, to be easier to follow those dynamic changes of the temperature, which is completely different uh, construction. That's kind of where I'm going with that, yeah. Exactly, I, I, I felt that it might yeah. be the case. So, so basically, assuming this is going to give a good potential results, then uh, engineers working on the construction of uh, digital electronics may actually say, OK, we're going now to stick to those results and, and make it easier for the thermoelectric converter to actually, you know, have those frequent mm. ups and downs in the temperature. Because currently they are, they've been working for many decades on the opposite. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. So and we were working on the opposite, and yeah. we were trying to make this <laughs> film smear. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Temperature yeah. stable, not no, to be. <laughs> no, trying to do the opposite, you know. <laughs> okay. Two. So the first one is, what devices are used for above? Mm -hmm. Like to see more. Uh, is this the? A table with a combustion. This is medium and yeah. I have the question again. I didn't follow. 
what devices are used for above 230C or 650C? Is it equal? <laughs> Okay. Oh, all right. Okay. So these are the the medium uh, heat uh, sources. So yes. So these are usually. So these are not devices. Uh, these these are the uh, the pipes of the combustion uh, engine of the plants. So this is where we have such a uh, high temperatures. But and usually these, so uh, these uh, temperatures are quite well utilized because the material. So this is a huge uh, temperature, and uh, and you don't really, and even natural radiation will help you to alter it. The second question is: What is the projected power output per unit area of these devices? Of uh, this, uh, we had that. So it's roughly about uh, in the range of millivolts per square millimeter. It depends on the Frequency of operation of the depends the operation regimes. That that's for a delta T of fifty. Fifty, isn't it? yes. What what is the expected delta T? Do you know? Um, in the in the EPU. Is that a no, question that? Okay. I thought you. I thought we saw a twenty degree there. Twenty, but this is twenty degree on the yeah. on the packaging. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. General microprocessor. Uh, which was measured without any idea about about the, the, the electric converters. But um, we can we can also think about the removing the CPU from the picture mm -hmm. and say because CPU means uh, general purpose, it means able to predict workload depending on the application. But if we think about a, a special purpose. Um, on, a on, on a machine or a device, yeah, so that you know exactly what exactly exactly all yeah. devices, yeah. sensors, yeah. sensors are special purpose, they the same thing yeah. constantly 24 7. Mm. It's of that order, um, we will have to measure <laughs> Get the measure, and then it's uh, so and all the devices they, they, they will require much. Much more energy than they'll require energy in the microwatts region. Okay. Well, I think if there are no further questions, I'd like to ask us to give uh, Peter a big vote of thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.